I'm gonna go Saturday in the morning to the, the synagogue here. She wasn't having it. <laughs> you step out of this house, you're out for good. So I told her, okay, I'm telling you right now, you take a foot out of this door, I'm gonna spank you, and you're gonna remember what my name is. And so I questioned her, I thought, why are you so upset? You didn't tell me to be Christian, Catholic, anything. Why does it bother you? So she said, you're going to sit down, and that's it. So I said, okay, fine. I sat down. Everybody, weekends, watch TV, football, soccer, whatever, chips, sit down in the living room. I took a pillow, and I covered my face. She said, what are you doing? I told her, Shabbos, we don't watch TV. I say, called my phone, don't pick up. Shabbos, we don't answer the phone. We don't touch electricity. Sat down like a mensch for the first time in my life with borachala, whatever food. And I sat down to eat in front of everybody. And I did this for a couple of shabbos. She didn't let me go. And I would cover my face and I would sleep through the whole shabbos. And during those weeks, I would dive into Hashem. She's not gonna back down that quickly. Help me that it should, it should work. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Meaningful People podcast. So happy to have you again. We sat down with an awesome guest this weekend. His name is Mayor Weiss. You probably do not know him. I had not known him up until I met him literally less than 24 hours ago. Um, It's one of those amazing stories of how we got this guest. Momo met somebody who knew Mayor, and we gave him a shout out in the episode, Ellie Schwab. One thing led to the next, and we had Mayor on the podcast, and we heard one of the most incredible stories we've ever heard on this podcast. So sit tight. It's an amazing episode of literally Mayor, who is formerly known as Nelson, who uh, had a Hispanic upbringing. He worked in a Jewish grocery, but I'm not going to spoil the story for you. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you see what he looks like now. It is unbelievable. Listen all the way to the end. It's an amazing episode. I want to give a big shout out to our friends at Alpert and Associates for sponsoring this episode. Moshe Alpert. Okay, guys, life insurance. You need to get the life insurance set up. You need to call Moshe Alpert. Or you can email him at alpertmoshe at gmail.com. You can call at 718-644-1594. I was in Moshe's office yesterday because I have a policy through Moshe. I have money invested with Moshe. So those are a couple of things that you need to really think about doing. Um, He showed me my portfolio. Things are looking pretty good, Baruch Hashem. And that's because Moshe knows what he's doing. His team knows what he's doing. And of course, Hashem is involved as well, very much. But Moshe is a good yid, so maybe that helps. Call Moshe Alpert, 718-644-1594. All your life insurance needs, your investment needs. When I was there in his office, someone actually called him from listening to the Meaningful People podcast. He had a meeting with them. Hopefully, it leads to business. Um, but maybe it's time that you reach out to him as well and see how we can take care of you. Um, we'll talk to you later on in this episode about our friends at Collars and Co, RCCS, and Aleph Beta. So enjoy this episode. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast, the podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Thank you so much, Mayor, for coming in, and I want to thank um, Ellie Schwab, Elliot Schwab. For introducing us and uh, Yoni Jonathan Kirshner yes. as well. Um, we met at a bar mitzvah and it was really great to meet you. And we really appreciate that you came into the office. I understand from them. I actually worked there. What's that? I worked there. Of course. Of course. Mm-hmm. No, but we met at the bar mitzvah first, I think, right? I don't think so. We met. On, I think we met. Oh, the they told me about you at the bar Could mitzvah. Be, maybe. Yeah. Erroneous. Very deep. Yeah. My bad. Yeah, I'm like, he's talking about a bar mitzvah. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, so Elliot Schwab made a bar mitzvah not long yeah, ago, yeah, as yeah, did correct. Jonathan Kirshner. Yeah, correct, Jonathan also made it. Exactly. It was like making bar mitzvah. Oh, we're both wearing glasses? Totally not planned, but okay. Very deep. Yeah. But this it's is sunny outside. This is one of those this is one of those guests that like we were some you were somewhere and like, yo, this guy would be great. And yeah. Then, and then you bumped into Mayor and in, in the place where he works. People ask me that a lot, by the way. How do you get like your guests? Like, where do they come from? And I, and cause someone's like, oh, I have a great idea. And I'm like, they come from these conversations. Totally. Like the ones that we're having. To be honest, I didn't even think as deep to come. Like I was like podcast, meaningful people podcast. I heard about it. I heard of it. Like we, we had 
whatever. Like I had a couple of people who mentioned it pr I'm, I'm prior and I saw some videos on YouTube and I heard, I was like, you know what? Maybe it sounds like a good idea. Well, uh, outside your comfort zone. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm I usually, it. usually, usually very quiet. I'm not, a. Uh, I'm usually hiding, you know, and behind everybody I'm quiet. So whatever, even though, even though we don't have an audience, I still feel like, you know, a little bit nervous, but no, I feel yeah. you a hundred percent. Um, so I guess, you know, let's, let's delve into the story of Mayor Weiss. You know, I know you said that you like to sit in the back, stay hidden. And I'm sure many people have stood next to you and, and they don't know your journey, your story. So if you can, I guess, take us from the beginning. What was your upbringing like? Where'd you grow up? Right. So I was born in Manhattan. Um, I spent about, I think two years there. Um, I don't have big memories on Manhattan, but, uh, I know that growing up, I moved to the Bronx. Um, I'm a child of two Mexican immigrants. Um, and I'm the middle child of two older sisters, two younger brothers. Uh, so I grew up in the Bronx. Um, we weren't the wealthiest, but, um, my uncle actually owned the property where we own, where we lived and he rented it out to his family and growing up there was um it was difficult and at the same time it was uh i don't know i i i i always look at things like today looking backwards it was like one of the biggest parts of like of my life growing up um because i i i learned a lot then um, I lived there, I think, to pro probably till I was like eight. And um, I went to public school there and I had very good teachers at school um, who really affected my life um, because they, as I'm going to mention later, they, they were very big like pillars to the, my, to the build up of, to the build up of my personality. Um, then I moved to Brooklyn, um, Bushwick. Uh, there, my uncle sold the property in the Bronx after a couple of years, and we moved to Brooklyn. Um, there um, was a bigger apartment, whatever, and I was the in high school. parents were working in the city when you were Correct. in the Bronx? Correct. And um, basically, um, once I was in Brooklyn, I started looking for high schools, whatever, like a normal kid. And I ended up finding a high school called Benjamin Banneker. This this high school is uh, um, it's like on Clinton and Myrtle. And basically, um, I started attending there. I found good stuff about it. I heard good stuff about it, and I decided to go there. In the middle of the year, um, my family was struggling a little bit financially, and I said, you know what? I was what maybe fifteen and a half, 16, and I said, um, I want to start working. And I was focusing solely on education. Um, growing up, it's one of the pillars of things like education, college, success, money, typical lifestyle, um, goals, careers, whatever you want to call it. And um, I said, you know what? Okay, fine. I want to I wanna start working because as I go into high school, I need to buy books. I need to, you know, wear nice clothing. You know, I'm starting to see the atmosphere is changing from middle school, high school. You go to high school, people are wearing nice clothes, nice shoes and everything. So I'm like, you know what? My parents can't afford it, but they're working very hard to just keep the roof on and cover basic expenses. I want to work and I want to be able to, to fund these things. So on my way back, I used to take a bus, just one route. It was a straight, straight bus, um, and there was a supermarket on the by one of the bus stops. And I decided, you know, what, I'm going to try the supermarket. So I went inside, and I spoke to Aid that was inside. It was a Jewish supermarket, and I spoke to somebody who was apparently the manager, and I asked him if he's looking to hire anybody. And he said, he asked me, "How old are you?" I told him, "I'm 15." He said, no way. So I said, okay, fine. I walked out. On the way out, I saw that my sister's husband worked there. I saw he was working there. You hadn't known that prior. I hadn't known that prior. Wow. And First Hashkacha protest. Yes. 
So I, I go to him and I'm, and I, and I tell him like, you know, I want to, I want to, I'm looking for a job. He asked me like, what are you doing here? I'm looking for a job. That was that. I make nothing of it. And over the weekend, he told me like, oh, there's a, there's a, a manager there that you could speak to. He's a cool guy. Gave me his number, text him, call him, tell him that I sent you. And that's it. Fine. I called this guy on to Shabbos, ended up being Saturday night, whatever. I called Saturday night and I told him, look, I'm related to such and such. I'm looking for a job. Are you looking to hire? So he said, yeah, yeah, come through. Fine. I walk into this place. It was a Thursday night, Thursday afternoon, hectic supermarket. I'm like, what's mm. going on here? Like, <laughs> and, and I couldn't talk to him for like two minutes mm. and I, until I pulled him over. And I said, you know, like, so he tells me, yeah, fine. You can start next week. I'm like, that's it? <laughs> fine. So I started working and I started just packing groceries. Um, that was your first exposure to the was, Heimische culture, that it's not what correct. you know, it's who you know. Correct. Yeah. And this was, an, <laughs> this was an addition to continuing your schooling? Correct. Okay. So the supermarket, the name of it is Chestnut Supermarket in Williamsburg. It's owned by Moshe Lazer Lando. Um, and... Maybe I shouldn't have said the age because whatever. <laughs> um, but anyways, he, so I started working. And Three years later. Right. right. <laughs> and um, I started working there. Once I started working there, no, there was nothing really to it. I started working. I was packing bags, uh, big rocket science. I was whatever. Although it's not easy. Yeah. You try opening one of these bags. Sometimes <laughs> they get stuck together. I have a lot of respect for the people back in the bags. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, then like Pesach season came in and Pesach was like a tenfold of what I was used to like working and I was promoted to register. So I started scanning people out. That's when I started talking to people more because as a, Packing bags, you're not really talking to anybody. Right. So I started talking to people, and one of the people who I who I spoke to um, was the person who was in charge of the Besmedrish next to Chestnut. So Chestnut is sitting on Myrtle Avenue, right next to it. There's a Satma Besmedrish, and he was the one person in charge of the Besmedrish, and he wanted me to. I, I know how to speak Spanish, so he wanted me to speak to the goyim that were working there, to the workers. That are working there, and um, by the way, am I allowed to say go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fine. Um, and so I used to translate for them back and forth. One day, I was. It was. I think it was in the morning. Um. Sunday, I think, or Sunday, and I walked in, and um, I found. Like people in this Madrish early, like davening. And I'm like, what's going on here? I'm like, so this kept going on for a couple more times. I used to walk into this and like nothing. I was comfortable. And one day in the afternoon, I went in and I'm hearing like koilis. One of the chadurim there, there was uh, somebody who was davening for the umid, but he was loud, or sharp. His voice was nice. And I like just like curiosity struck and I and I walked in like a little bit. I didn't know they were in the middle of a minion, but they were Davani Mencha. And this guy who was by the Umid, I see he's chuckling a little bit and he's like really emotional when he's davening. I was like, what's going on? Like, what is this? So I went to the best rabbi. Can I interject? Did, yeah. did you have growing up, did you have any exposure to going to church or prayer, any, any kind of organized so my, spiritual work? So my father was Catholic, is, not sure. Um, my mother was not religious. She doesn't really belong anywhere, but she believes in God. And one of the things growing up that um, was very important, which brings me back to the Bronx, because in the Bronx, we had we had a period of time where my mother and my, my, my both parents separated. And my mother couldn't handle everything financially. Um, and my mother used to always tell me, you know, like, 
I don't know where he is, who he is, or what he is, but know there's God in the world. So you have to, before you go to sleep, always pray. Thank for the day, and ask God to give you another day, more blessings, and that's it. Is that, is that something that you pra- that you did that you practiced? Yes, you did. Yes, as a young as right. a. Well, I'm just curious, what, what would those prayers look like if, if you could give us a peek? Like, so again, one of one of the most important things for me has always been family, and even regardless now that I converted and I, I became Jewish, I have a close connection to my mother because, as you guys understand a little bit later, she has and she has like I'm not here where I'm sitting today without her. So um, my understanding then was not like a person who's 18, knows life a little bit. Um, my, my understanding then was, you know, I wanted to help my mother. My mother, that my mother should have strength, that we should be able to, you know, continue going. And we should be healthy and I should have toys and I should have this. These were my prayers. Um, and... Yeah, so in reference to that question, that that was that. Um, but this always, it carried along through the years. Like, it went from one thing to another, to another, to another. For me, one of my strongest things today in Yiddishkeit is tefillah. By far, it's one of the, is it it is the connection that I have with Hashem. Um, and you encountered that for the first time in that Satmar Bismandrish during that minion. Correct. So you knew what they were doing. You knew I, they were I didn't know what they were doing. You, Only after I found out, I went on Google, Chabad popped up. And you must I, have been so confused. Yeah, I was confused. I always wondered. I was confused because you have, you know, somebody standing by the by the Yeah. By the by the, by the, by the, yeah, the right what and, and, and he's shuckling and he's davening and usually like the standards are 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 like not they're slanted, right? So he's like going like this i'm like what is this guy doing like so i went on google and i typed in like what do jewish people do in the afternoon and chabad pops up mincha afternoon prayers i went in and they had a link to the shmanasser and i was reading through it i was like wow it's a nice prayer <laughs> so i started looking at the, the procedure like the abcs what do i have to do here and then at work, as I was learning more and more and more, I was asking more. So people at the beginning, is kind of interesting because I started doing things and asking um, questions to be funny. But really, it was because I was embarrassed to ask people, like, this is interesting. I want to know more. So I had a very good connection with customers and, and the managers there. Um, because just because I was a good worker and they knew me from the store and I was very, like, you know, talkative. And so I, I used to ask questions and the buildup of those questions led to, to, to me being like, okay, one day I was like, you know what? I want to wear a couple, a yarmulke. So I started, it started as a joke, but really it wasn't a joke because I had read on Chabad that, that there was a story of a Ganef, that, that the mother was um, crying, whatever, and told him if, she cover, if he covers his head, he won't be, he won't be a, a thief. So when I read the story, I was like, what's, what's shot? Like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> so I said, you know what? Let me cover my head. I was like, that shows fear of heaven. What does it show? Like, what? So I put on a yarmulke. Only in only in the in the grocery, and people thought it was funny, and they laughed. And this internally, it wasn't funny for me, but mm. nobody knew this because I, I I myself wasn't sure what this was leading to. And then, as time went on, like people started getting friendly with me. People like quiz me on different things, and I would answer. And I don't think people really thought much of it. One day, I had somebody, one of the customers he was technically my friend also he comes into the to the grocery and probably had a day off he was like upset he comes and he rips off my yarmulke and he tells me you can't have it i told him 
why? It's like, what do you, you think this is a joke? What, what, what are you doing? And I was like, nothing. I'm just covering my head. So I put on my hoodie. I had a hoodie then. So I covered my, 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 my head with a hoodie. He's like, why are you taking it away from me? He didn't want to talk to me. He was upset. He went to the back to the, of the grocery. He wanted to smoke a cigarette, whatever. And I followed him. I was like, give me my capo. And he's like, what do you think? This is a joke? This is a joke to you? And, and then he, he was a strong person. A lot of koyach. And I, I managed to squeeze out the, the yarmulke from his hand. And he, he, he said something that really hurt me. Like he said, you're a lost fish in the sea. Wow. And I thought about it. And that's why it hurt me because I really was. And I said, why does it hurt me so much? The reason was because I was, I didn't have direction. I didn't have happiness and I was missing something. So I started learning more about. I want to open a parenthesis, something that you said that just struck me as very insightful. When a person encounters an insult, if a person is confident that what the aggressor is saying is not right. true, then it's not so hurtful. It's like me saying to you, you're an alien. Right. It doesn't like, bother you. Erroneous. I'm not an alien. So totally erroneous. It doesn't have an effect. But when, when a person hits on a chord, when there's this thread of truth underlying it, that's, that opens up a wound. Correct. And, and, and as a result, like he, he, he mentioned this to me and I was, there was two people in the, in the, in the room. And one of them was like, just like, he didn't know what to do. He was like, why, why are you treating him like that? But he didn't say anything. And then this guy was just like upset, man, day off or whatever. And then like, I, I didn't want to cry in front of them. So I just like, I was like, you know what? Forget it. I walked out and then I went to the side and like, I started, I started crying. I felt bad. And at the moment I didn't, I, I couldn't explain why, but I, I like to, I have a reflection process that I, I I'm con like, it's constant for me. Like every day, end of the day it's like what happened today how did you change what did you do and 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 that night i was like why does it hurt me so much and i it was because of that because i was really lost i didn't have a purpose in my life and i felt empty and then i was already making i was making some money i didn't have any expenses right the best life possible money no expenses so i had nice clothes shoes everything living the dream Correct. Oh yeah. Where did you develop that uh, that daily reflection process? That sounds really cool. In the Bronx, because because when my parents separated, I had two sisters, a younger brother, and a newborn then, and they all they all gravitate to me for 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 direction. So, I'm basically. Uh, what if a six-year-old thinking from my brothers and sisters, right? So they seek the direction and confidence in me. So I had to think, yeah, like I, I knew that my parents weren't together. How do I, how do I make it better for them as well? You know, like how do I, how do I make it less painful for them to understand that we don't have money for this or we didn't have money for that, right? Um, I remember... I, it, I used to sleep on a on a pink elephant bed. I was a boy. Yeah, what boy wants to sleep on a pink elephant bed, right? But I, I, I this is what my my mother had, and it's not like she didn't want to provide for me. She just couldn't, right? So how do I, how do I explain this to a kid younger than me that we are sleeping on a pink elephant bed because we don't have the money to, right? He he doesn't understand this. So I had to mature much quicker and and i had to explain it to him like you know make a i i made something out of it i don't remember exactly but i think i made like oh this is so cool and whatever so the reflection process started happening internally for me like why is this happening to us like why is my father here like does he love us does he not love us like why is he not a part of my life right and and my mother was also helping me answer some things because I was very vocal. Like if I had a question, I would ask. 
and and she would answer you know she would she would always speak good positive and and that's where that reflection process started and as you get older once you once you're accustomed to do something like it just becomes like a habit and and i like in a sense i think now now that i'm thinking about it a little bit more um in a sense like i want it to be not like my father so i had to develop traits completely opposite to his right so was it something that that you were worried about like were you worried that you were going to be like your father in essence i'm still to this day you're yes. still worried about that yes. and that's why you you work on developing character traits yeah because i feel that that one of the most important things that a child sees on a daily basis are his parents and you could sniff the truth and and the fake yeah so i feel like i mean i remember all the important people in my life they they sh- they had something that that i just remember them by and it ends up being that this is their main attribute their main quality um so i don't want my children to see a reflection of anything that he didn't show me and so i always have i grew up with him right so and he was part of my life later when they got back together so i was always on the constant like it was a constant battle like he's my father and i know he works hard and but i don't see him like he's not like he was my mother was my father and and mother mm. right so although he was present in the house like he lived there i didn't have a father like he just wasn't there right and and as you grow up i'm pretty sure there's a lot of things that 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 kids want to speak to with a male role model and challenges that you have that i didn't get to necessarily speak to him but ashem was very he helped me out a lot of, as i converted before you knew I, hashem correct that 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 i was able to talk to the right people and he put the right people in front of me that in a sense made up for all that time that that i didn't have a father mm-hmm. we'll be right back to this episode of meaningful people i have a quick question for you why does god let us suffer how can we make Tisha B'Av feel relevant and meaningful for us today when the destruction of the base of Migdash happened so long ago? These questions are impossible to answer, but on Tisha B'Av, they are impossible to ignore. With Tisha B'Av approaching very fast, I want to encourage you to check out Aleph Beta's collection of Tisha B'Av videos. Rabbi David Foreman, the founder of Alpha Beta, was on our podcast. He is one of my favorite guests we've had on this podcast. And his videos explore some of the most beloved Tisha B'Av texts to discover the deeper meaning of the relevance of the day. And right now, we will offer you a promo code to get $18 off of the annual premium subscription. That is promo code bam meaningful 23 that is meaningful 23 when you subscribe you get the discount 18 dollars off your your annual premium subscription i have an account at alf beta i pay for it for the year the content is amazing it is thought-provoking it is meaningful it is deep Rabbi foreman does an incredible job and alf beta does an amazing job creating the content it is something that you've never seen before alf beta has been around for such a long time and they've been leaders in the field in in the industry of what they do head to alfbeta.org make sure to use promo code meaningful 23 you can hit the link in the description of the show notes of this episode and you will go there and Merch Hashem, Tisha B'Av should be a Yontif this year, and our performance is going to have to make some new videos, but go check it out. Now back to this episode. It's the trait of a Chacham. Chazal say, Ezu Chacham Halomin Mikal Adam. And hopefully we have enough people that we can learn from what to do. Correct. But sometimes there are people in our life, and we have to find a way to learn from them also, sometimes what not to do. Right. Um, once I started getting more knowledgeable on Yiddishkeit, I started asking myself like constantly, what do you want to do? Why are you learning? Like, where's this going? Why are you doing this? Like, you don't really have a purpose on doing it, like learning anything like, well, it was the end game. Yeah. Right. And, and I was like, I'm just curious. So it led to another thing. And I used to hear Shidem and, I was so intrigued, like, 
And I had a feeling, I had a feeling, something warm, like almost like belong, like I, I belonged there. Like this, my, like my, my, my being was treading in the right direction. And so I reached out to a, a rabbi in Barra Park and he told me, look for the nearest Chabad house, speak to the rabbi. And if he wants to teach you, uh, I'll guide you. Okay. Go back on Chabad.com, type, put in my zip code, ends up being that behind my house, two blocks down, there was Chabad house. Look at the stories that are about to begin. <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly in Yehuppetzville. This is... Uh... I called the Chabad house. And the rabbi said, the rabbi, okay, fine. Um, meet me tomorrow at 7 7. I told him what time? He says, 7 o'clock. Oh. Okay. He would have said 7 70 if it existed that time. <laughs> <laughs> Surprising to say like 8 10. <laughs> so I woke up at 7 o'clock. My mother asked me, Where are you going? I told her, I need to go to school early. Then there was like regents, whatever. I was like, They're making a pre class for regents. I wanted to go. So. This was my, I get there and I see a guy standing on the corner, gingy beard, almost like orange. And I'm like, I know this guy from somewhere. Ends up being that this rabbi from the Ridgewood community um, used to go to a barber shop that is owned by Russian Jews or not religious. And I happened to be there once with my brother. They were my barbers. The guy wow. walks in. And I, I was... Blowing the shoifer. Blowing the shoifer. I was sitting there with my brother. And we were covering our faces. Because it was funny. Like, this guy's coming in, blowing on a piece <laughs> of stick. Like, what, what's this guy doing? <laughs> we're laughing there. And that memory just came back. And I said, I asked him, you were at this barbershop? He's like, yeah. He's like, those, and he explained to me the whole story on these um Yiddish kinder there. He was he ended up being my 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 teacher. Wow. Wow. Um, what was what you, you you mind saying his name? I don't I, his first name is Nochem. Okay. Um his last name is a little bit tricky. Can I check? You can check. Sure. You said orange beard. My name is Menachem. I'm just making sure it wasn't <laughs> me, you know. <laughs> Just making How's sure. your Schreifer blues and skills? <laughs> Not so good. I have him saved as Rabbi Nochem. That's good enough, Rabbi Nochem. But sure, Menachem, I know by the way. <laughs> it's no way. It's, no way his name is Nachman or anything. Who? Sarvechev. Sarvechev. Yeah. If you could just turn it down. I just want to. Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Right. Okay, so. Rabbi Nochem. Rabbi Nochem. Rabbi Nochem Sarvechev. Yeah. Gewalt. So that's like pretty trippy. Like you were blowing the show from the barbershop and yeah, and I want to become Jewish now. <laughs> no, this was, this was, so when I saw him then in Crown Heights, this memory was from like yeah, a couple way back. Of months ago, whatever. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember exactly the time, but I remember him being there with my brother and him walking in and losing the shoifa. So I asked, asked him, he's like, yes. So I, I learned with him every single day. I think about a year. And he was giving feedback to the Zruv who was leading the conversion until it was said and done. And then I I was I was coming home. From uh, that time where you reached out and sort of made up to meet at 770, you knew already that you were on this journey to, to Garris? I, I, to be honest, at the very beginning, like the first two weeks, I was still unsure. I, was not, I, I wasn't sure because I didn't know what the response of my, parent, my parents were gonna, was going to be. And I was also testing myself a little bit. Like, like, I thought, like, do I see myself living this life in the future? Like, do I really want to do this? And, and, and am I able to follow everything? Like, what's the purpose? Why are you doing this? That was my main question. Like, why are you doing this? 
Um, and the answer to that was that I was looking for something. I was looking for closeness, and I was looking for um, I was looking for closeness to God. Um, the question was who, which one, which religion, which path, and I had I had opportunities to to hear out other people, but something just didn't sit right. It was either the story didn't match. I ask a lot of questions. If I if I if I ask a question and you push off a response or something's not answered or it leaves you with like an like Sushmeknisht. Yeah. And and I asked somebody once, uh Yid from Williamsburg, I asked him a question and he says, I don't know the answer, but I'm sure there's an answer. You're asking the wrong person. Mm. I don't know. But there is an answer. This was for me like, oh, there's answers. So who to ask the question, how to get the answer is the, the challenge, right? But there's answers. Toyota has the answer to everything. You just need to find the correct person to answer your question. So as I was sort of sort of like self-testing myself, I I ask myself all these questions over and over again every week, every day. Mind you, I was going to study with him from 7 to like 8.30. Then I would rush to high school. Then after that, I would go to work. And then 3, 4 o'clock till 11, that was closing. 12-ish, Yom Tivs, before Yom Tivs, it was till 12, 1. So it took a toll. And... I did. I, I I was motivated. That's that was what surprised me the most. Like I wanted to to go, and and we were learning Tanya. Tanya has some elevated stuff. Like it's not. <laughs> but I was like, whoa, what's this? Like I was so fascinated at at, at the different avenues of of, of Kedisha and this and that, and I'm like, like, where was I till now? Like, if, <laughs> and then I decided. I said. I want to do it. So how did I? How do I bring up the conversation to my parents? Yeah, <laughs> I get home. I bought online. It wasn't online actually. It was in a store in Crown Heights, Tzitzis. And then I wanted to wear them at night. So I took them out the packaging. And my mother sees it. And she's like, "What's this?" I told them. I told them that they're Tzitzis. She's like, take this, take this out of my house. I don't want to see this. What's this? You start working in a Jewish supermarket, all of a sudden this and this and that. And I'm, uh, I, told, I was like, I want to wear them. I've been studying. I, I want to wear them. No, we weren't raised like this and this is in our direction. I told her, oh yeah, what's her direction? Mm. What's our direction? Tell me, my, tell, tell me what's our direction. Couldn't answer. I thought, exactly. We don't have a direction. We're just floating through life every single day. One day you tell me, pray to God. Who's that God? I don't know. We'll figure it out. I think I figured it out. Mother was hurt. I'm a chitz of like. You told her that she was a fish lost at sea. Right. And she didn't say anything, but she grounded me. And. That's when I felt like I'm good with my decision. Why? Why did you feel then you're good with your decision? Because if I had the guts to take that step and just like speak out like that to my mother, I respect my mother very much. Right. I, 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 it was like a natural instinct for me to defend what I, what I, what I believed in. And I, I thought, you know, I felt good. I felt good afterwards. Felt right. Right. And happens to be that that weekend, Shabbos, the rabbi told me, come to my shul, Shabbos. He walks from Crown Heights all the way to Ridgewood, which is like about an hour and a half, two hour walk every Shabbos. And he said, come down. We're making a minion. You could be part of the Shabbos prayers. So I told my mother, I'm going to go Saturday in the morning to the, the synagogue here. She wasn't having it. 
you step out of this house, you're out for good. So I told her, okay. She said, I'm telling you right now, you take a foot out of this door, I'm going to spank you, and you're going to remember what my name is. So I questioned her, why are you so upset? You didn't, you didn't tell me to be something. You didn't tell me to be Christian, Catholic, anything. Why does it bother you? We didn't grow up like this. I told her, we, you don't, you, she, my mother's very different from her family. She's the one outcast. I told her, you're different from everybody else. I'm different from everybody else too. So I'm exactly like you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't answer, but she wasn't having it. So she said, you're going to sit down. And that's it. So I said, okay, fine. I sat down. Everybody, weekends, watch TV, football, soccer, whatever, chips, sit down in the living room. I took a pillow and I covered my face. She said, what are you doing? I told her, Shabbos, we don't watch TV. Didn't have what to say. Called my phone. I don't pick up. Shabbos, we don't answer the phone. We don't touch electricity. Sat down like a mensch for the first time in my life with borachala, whatever food. I sat down to eat in front of everybody. She was not having it at all. And I did this for a couple of shabus. She didn't let me go. And I would cover my face and I would sleep through the whole Shabbos. And during those weeks, I would dive into Hashem and I would ask him to make it easier. Just make it that it should go easy. She's not gonna back down that quickly. Help me that it should it should work. And nature took its course. As time went by, she became much more sensitive to it, and I and she saw that I was really changing. And I was doing nothing wrong. I was going to school. I was in honors. I graduated with honors. I was doing everything right. I was working. She didn't have what to hold against me because I was doing the correct thing. It's not like you were rebelling. Correct. Yeah, it's not, like, it's, not like, it's not like it was a bad influence. Correct. Quite the opposite. My brothers took much more different light to me. Like I was talking to them about different things. I was, I was engaging them in, in other ways. And then comes Simchas Toira. Simchas Toira was the first Yom Tev that I spent. Fully, 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 fully. Not fully, I had to make a malucha, but... At this point, if you don't mind me asking, at this point, were you, were you did you had converted or no, no, not? I was, not yet. No. I was still I was still In the learning. process. I was still learning. You okay. have to learn a certain amount yeah. of time. You said he did a malucha. We'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. But first, a quick word from our friends at RCCS. You all know about RCCS, the Rofei Cholom Cancer Society. They do incredible things for Klai Yisrael. They help out so many people. Um, and July 18th and 19th, they are having a fundraiser. It is called Raising the Bar. Uh, at driveup.com forward slash RCCS. If you don't know what they do, they have a budget of $19.5 million a year. 19, that's close to $20 million a year uh, that their, their budget. What does that go towards? Well, $9.6 million is total recovered through insurance advocacy. Uh, $1 million is facilitated in pharmaceutical and compassion grants. They have over 4,600 patients that they deal with who are unfortunately battling cancer and when someone gets a diagnosis their first call is to rccs to figure out well how are they going to get through this how are they going to manage this financially how are they going to manage this manage this emotionally what is it what is going to be with their family and Kali Soro is amazing is amazing that we have rccs and we need to make sure that we take care of RCCS. So July 18th and 19th, you can head to driveup.com forward slash RCCS, guidance, funding, care. That is RCCS. And as a claw, we need to make sure that they are taken care of. And it should be a schuss that none of us should ever need to use their services. Now back to this episode. You said he did a malacha because uh, Goy Shashavas is an issue. You, you were reminding me when you said about the walk and that you wanted to wear tzitzis. There's an old joke about uh, someone who's going through uh, Gerus. So it's a problem. Right. It's tricky. So he wears a pair of tzitzis so that it's an uh, extra baguette. It's not necessary. So he's right. carrying on Shabbos. So he gets to wear tzitzis and he's carrying on Shabbos. So, you, yeah. so then, then the person says, oh, but there's an Erev over here. 
So he says, well, you think I hold from that era? <laughs> <laughs> so you had to do, <laughs> so you had to do a malacha. Yes. Which, which malacha did you do? So what I would do is at the beginning, I would just flick like light. Mm -hmm. uh, like right when Shabbos started? Not when Shabbos started. Mamish by the end. By the end. I made sure that. Why, it why by the end? Flick because it didn't feel right. It, it hurt me to do these malachas. Right. You, meaning you would end Shabbos so earlier my snow was while it was still Shabbos. While it was Shabbos. Right. I'm sure, I'm sure according to some Zaman, it was still, it was not Shabbos anymore. No, no I, I, made sure to, yeah, I, okay. I made sure to not go into the... <laughs> right after Shabbos. He, he, yeah, like, he wasn't holding 72 and okay. <laughs> yeah. And so, so at that time I was, I was in, I was in high school. I was in my 12th grade. Wow. Um, and I started going black and white. I started growing my pious. I started putting them behind my ear. And the people around me just like, were just like looking at me. The, the interesting part of that whole experience, like they all knew me from school. And I was, I was, I wouldn't say I was a popular kid. I was a well-known person. Like I, like I said, I had the nicest shoes, every yeah. new Sneaker release, I had the, the, the best Jordans, whatever. Mm. So people gravitated towards me like I was with the cool guys. So people knew me. What, what, what was your name? What they know you as? Nelson. Nelson, okay. Yeah. And when like this whole change happened, like they were like a little bit shocked. But they, at the same time, they were like understanding in a weird way. And I actually had a friend, his, his name was Lamar. Once I started explaining to him a little bit more, like, you know, I can't touch women. Like, there has to be, like, you know, I can't physically touch them. I can only, you know, whatever. He used to walk with me through the halls. And he used to, he used to see, like, it was, it's natural for people to greet each other. Hey, good morning, a hug and a kiss on the cheek, right? So he'd be like, no, he's Jewish. He can't, he can't. He hey, can't he was your it. bouncer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so I didn't have such a negative experience, right? And, and they... I used to talk to them also, and, and they used to understand me, and they, they supported me, like my friends. And so I was going, starting with the Levish, slowly, 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 and my mother was seeing it also. And then I decided I wanted to go to Etzisru. I was 17. It was 17 July, August. I decided I wanted to go to Etzisru to learn. So this was... July was when I finished my conversion. So what happened there was, I skipped a chunk. What happened there was um, the the rabbi who was guiding me, his name was Avrum Reich. He put together the base din. He checked on my progress and he was happy with it. So we started with the bus. I got a, got a circumcision. And you have to heal. At 17. Yeah. Uh, technically, that's a problem because they're not allowed to, only 18, but I pushed them very much. Um, then I, I had to heal, and then I went to Vila. And I remember walking into the water. It was, I don't know if it was just me. The water felt like it was 200 degrees. Wow. <laughs> Boiling hot. It wasn't. I know what uh, Mikfu is, you know. A high It was boiling. Like, I felt like boiling. It was burning my skin. And it wasn't that hot because afterwards I put my hand back inside and it wasn't hot. Walking in, it was boiling, boiling hot. And I, I, was, I was like thinking like, this is it. Like, you can't back out. If you're going forward, you're going forward. If you can't, stop right now. And I said, no. I'm going to keep walking. And I went down the steps, and then I was toil. Because I'll say that uh, Ger gets the neshama in the emergence from the mikvah. So Correct. the person goes in without a neshama, and that's how you're illustrating. Right. And in there. That's how I felt Yeah, at that good. moment. That's what I felt. My The sensation from the water was boiling hot. Wow. When I know that... that to be in a mikvah, to be able to be in a mikvah, one needs a neshama. Yeah. Gewalt. Um Once that happened, the davening was different. The learning was different for the first week. 
Mm. And then it started going down. Really? Yeah. I used to feel like, like the first time. So the first mitzvah that I actually did was Pantzul. Um, The next morning, whatever. Davant Shachris in 770. I had a sense, I, I had a weird thing like in the, my fingertips. Like, I, like I could feel like my, my body was about to like come out of my fingertips. <laughs> like I had a pressure on my fingertips. I think your film was too tight. <laughs> <laughs> those are those little pricks. No. <laughs> and I, I felt like when I dove in, like I felt my, like I was getting somewhere and it happened for the first week or so. And then it just, just went away. So the, so the, the, what the intensity or the, and and that's not something that you were prepared for or you wanted. I I don't know. I I don't know. I think that's, that's the human condition when something is new when something is fresh. So it has an incredible his We see it every year. Like Elul, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, people walk out of Ni'ila on a, on a high. And then literally could be 27 hours later. And it's just like, not so much. So, so. So the people who were mentoring me then, um, when I spoke to them about this, that's what they told me. They told me, so you're fresh off the, off the oven. You know, yeah. you, you take out a baguette from the oven, it's boiling, you push it down, it's whoo. It's machaya, yeah? <laughs> you let it sit on the shelf two or three days, it becomes cold. Well, I remember one of the, one. he told me, this is going to be your life struggle. Every single day, you need to be burning hot. Not be cold. You see how cold it feels, yeah. right? It doesn't feel like that. If it was that or it was something else, or it was just my mind. I don't know, but I can only tell you what I felt. Um, and then a lot of things started changing. Like I I, I was going to Yamtiv, to people's houses. People already knew me then, the famous um guy that converted in the grocery. The guy who worked in the grocery who packed the bags and yeah. now is a year. Traded in the Jordans for a Bekisha. Correct. Well, you're taking a stab at a title over there, Melvin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Before that, I I, I used to spend shab. I I, I spent simchas Torah by somebody. I'm um, one of my friends. I'm in Williamsburg. That's where my crowd was at the beginning. Like, it still is. I'm friends with a lot of people there. But that's where I, it it all started in Williamsburg. Um, and I used to go to people's houses. Some of them were comfortable with me going even as an Anjou, but um, and I remember walking into Shiel, Simchas Torah, South Mepis I walked in, I was like the white dot on the black sheet. The moment I walked in, 500 people were staring at me. Oh. And I ended up buying the, the seventh Akofa there. And... I was dancing with the Toyota, with the dying of the Bismarck. I remember it was like something, it was just like a feeling that I had inside. It was a very good feeling. And these were all things that like validated what I was doing. Like it wasn't the, the, the fact that I bought something. It wasn't the fact that I was dancing. It was just a genuine, like I felt happy. Like I felt in place. The whole process wasn't that complicated. The The, the learning for me wasn't a schlep. The switching from eating non-kosher food to eating kosher food, it wasn't a schlep. Like, it just happened like this. Wow. There was no, it wasn't difficult for you? No, to- it wasn't. It wasn't. Okay. It was just like, like, I felt like I was coming home. You were no longer a fish lost at sea. Right. You were a piece of herring at the uh, Kiddush. <laughs> <laughs> exactly where it's supposed to be. Hey, Bauman, you know how they make fish into herring, right? <laughs> Um, did did you feel you know I guess when you're in that sovereign based measures dancing with the, with the Torah of the seven Akafa, did you feel like you belonged? You're asking the crowd. I'm asking you if because you had mentioned that you were like the the blacked out on a white sheet. Because I'm walking into a place where you only see pious Beckiches, Stramo, these type of um um Kapliches. So I felt different, but I didn't care. That that's one of the, like it's one of the things that 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 I had to learn very quickly is not care what people perceive of I me. Like that, yeah. And and I, I don't pay attention to it till this day. I I'm focused on what my purpose here in the world is. 
what I understand it to be. Mm-hmm. It could change tomorrow, but today, what I see. My wife likes the expression, what people say and think about you is none of your business. Right. <laughs> I, I, if I were to have listened to every single person who said something, I had from people saying, you know, why do you have to convert? You could have your young years, have fun, go out, party, enjoy. Once everything, you convert. Why do you have to do it now? Go to college, learn, get a successful job. You're going to be successful. You're going to be able to find a good shidduch. Hmm. You're going to be able to have panusa. You're not going to be dependent on everybody. Nebuch, all the gaidim and all the balchivas, you know, they, they live off this and that. If I were to listen to every single person that said something, I wouldn't be where I'm standing today. I'd be doing something different every month. The reason why I wanted to leave to Eretz was because I felt... Perp- like I felt that I wanted to learn Yiddishkeit, so once I started, once I once I was already fully um, um, magayir, um, I was at a very very low level of Yiddishkeit. Yeah, you you study and you learn, but it's not it's different when you're actually living it. So I started learning whatever I could. You know, after my day, I had school, work, whatever. End of the day, you're zapped with. You don't have any energy to learn, whatever. So I would get pi- uh, pieces and bits here and there. And I felt it wasn't enough. And life led me to decide that I needed to go to Eretz to go into yeshiva, and I had to learn full time. So I started getting information on yeshivas, and I ended up coming across um, a yeshiva in Yerushalayim. It's called Torah Vemina. It's um, under the guidance of Bells, Yerushalayim. And I called over there, or the Chir or whatever, spoke to him. He has a slot for me. So I'm ready to fly to this room. Only problem is I'm 17. <laughs> I'm just my guy. My mother doesn't give me. She didn't let me leave the country. She didn't let me wear tits, you think? She <laughs> <laughs> She's still at this point. You convert, and she didn't come around to it. She she knew what was happening, but maybe she thought it was like a phase or something. Right? You know, like okay, it let him do it, and what? So once I decided to go to Tzuru, that ended up happening. I come to her and I tell her that I need her to sign up. Uh, permission that I she didn't want. Ended up being that I schlepped it till my birthday, my 18th birthday, when I'm able to fly by myself. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go, whether you like it or not. And I got up and I flew. I went to it. So I left, I left my job. Um, mind you, the day that I flew to it, so I got a call from one of a big university um, offering me a full ride scholarship to the college. And I was like, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to decline. Why? You know who we are? I said, yes, I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm flying to Israel tomorrow, and I don't, I'm not interested. She said, what university in Israel is, is better than us? That's not a university. Torah <laughs> minute. So I get there, and um, yeah, that's, that's where the new phase of Mayor Weiss, that was the beginning of... How, how did you, I guess, either you choose the name Mayor Weiss, how did the name Mayor Weiss come to be? It happened at the, by the bris. By the bris. I was contemplating different names. So like I mentioned, like you asked me before what my name yeah. was. So my name was Nelson. So everybody in the grocery anyways called me Nusen. Mm. <laughs> Nusen. <laughs> so Nusen was a, one of the names. But I, I always had something from Mayer. Mayer is or, like a light. And I remember reading somewhere then, like, guide him, bring light to the world. The world is dark, Gare brings light. So it ended up. And the Weiss? The Weiss, Vas. Yiddish Vas is white. <laughs> Clean slate, nothing behind me. Very good. Wow. Clean. Um, 
Wow, that's special. I'm just going to do this one more time to you. We'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. I don't usually wear a shirt. I mean, I, I wear clothing. I like sweatshirts. I like comfortable wear. I'm a comfort guy. But when I do wear a shirt, I wear Collars & Co. Because that is comfortable. And it looks good. Every Shabbos, every time I have a meeting, every time I have a podcast, unless I'm wearing a Be Kind sweatshirt, whatever. Shout out to the merch. But I'm usually wearing Collars & Co. You need to head to collarsandco.com, use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off. So many of you told me that you just made an order at Collars & Co. How are you, Yitzhak Galter? I know you ordered Collars & Co. You forgot to use the promo code. Shame on you. I'm kidding. You're the best. But guys, use the promo code. It's 15% off. Use promo code 15% off of the most comfortable and best looking shirts in the entire shirt industry. That is collarsandco.com. Uh, just they have other stuff as well. They have sweaters, but the shirts are are their main are their main product. The firm collar, the soft shirt. You heard me say it before, and I'll say it again. The most comfortable shirt in the world, and you will look amazing. You'll thank me later, but use the promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off. And a quick word from the Tesla Chicago Chesed Fund. Guys, you go win a Tesla of your choice or $50,000 cash. Um, what would I do? Surely, what would you do? Editor, Surely Staff, what would you do? $50,000 or the Tesla? $50,000 or the Tesla? I, I don't know. It's a really good question, but you can't even ans answer that question unless you buy a ticket to this raffle. You need to go ahead and go to ccfraffle.com. That is ccfraffle.com. Use, use the code MPP. Use, use code MPP and you will get $25 off of two tickets or $500 off of 15 tickets. Use promo code MPP and you can answer that question. $50,000 or a Tesla? $50,000 or a Tesla? I, I would probably take the cash. That's just me. But what would you do? Well, buy a ticket and maybe we'll find out. Now back to this episode. So um, you're in Artisrael and you you started, you know, getting close to Bells. So I started getting close to Bells, yes. Um, I started getting close to Bells. Um, I was in the yeshiva. I hadn't seen the Rebbe then for maybe 10 months, 11 months. I w then I, was, I wasn't part of Bells. I wasn't... I had more of a, in my mind, I was like, you know, all I knew was Williamsburg, Satma. So I was in that mentality. And the Satma Rebbe went a couple of times to Yishalayim. I, I was following him, you know, whatever I went with him. But I, I didn't have anything with Belsen. Um, then one day, Hanukkah, the Rebbe likes when all the Talmidim from this yeshiva come to him and he gives Hanukkah gelt for all the, for all the Talmidim. So we went. And I got my Hanukkah gelt. Fine. Then one of the Rabunim there told me, maybe go into the Rebbe. Introduce yourself. You know, it'd be a nice thing. I said, okay, fine. I'll go to the Rebbe. So we're by the Rebbe, waiting outside of the Rebbe's room. And the Rebbe tells, uh, whatever. Uh, then they call us out, whatever. We go into the Rebbe. And the Rebbe looks at me. He's like this. What's your name? Mayor Weiss, where are you from? I told him America. He says, who's your, who's your rabbi? Who, meaning, who's your rav? Who, who's your guidance? That's what he was asking me. I didn't answer. I was like. Free agent. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I can't say South because at the end of the day, really, I'm not clicking in like, whatever. Yeah. I'm there. I know Yiddish guy through their lenses, but I'm not part of this community. I can't say my Chabad teachers. I, I don't know where. I didn't say anything. So the Rebbe smiled and he said, It's Erev Shabbos, the Rosh Hashiva gives a Shein to Erevimim. He calls me in to his office and he says, the Rebbe says that he wants you to go to his house Shabbos in the morning, mid tish He wants you to eat Shabbos seed in the free. In the morning, he wants you to eat Shabbos with him. I said, pretty cool. Why me? <laughs> yeah, like, what do I have with him? Like, Mind you then, the reason why I'm saying like, what do I have with him? Like, who is he? Is, is I always liked that male role in my life. Right. So I had a, one of the, one of, one of the most difficult things that I had was respecting a male authority. 
because I never had someone to respect. So it was like, oh, this guy thinks he's holy. Who, who is he? Like, you know? Like summoning me to yeah, like, appear. Like, I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a big mehechatezi. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I'm fine. So the Rebbe said, uh, the, the Rosh Hashiva told me, he's like, you know, I'm going to tell you the information, speak to the, this other, the, the, uh, another one from the Rebbe in the yeshiva, and he'll set you up. So okay, fine. So he's like, it's not a suggestion. He's like, you're right, going to be there. Right. It, it's like when you it, jump out of a plane, like, pulling the you know, parachute like, is, great. A, good, is yeah. a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He'll set you up and you'll go. I said, I said, fine. What do I have to lose? One Shabbos, it doesn't work out. So I go and I dive into the bells and beautiful thrillers. I was very surprised. I enjoyed it. And then get to the point where the Rebbe, we, the Rebbe um, goes out through his uh, pathway in the Bismedish and he's walking towards me. Like there's a lot of people waiting outside of his, um, like his room and he's walking towards me and I like start like, I start getting like shaking. Like I'm like, what's going on? Like I started getting like a pocket and we go in and we're sitting down. Mind you, there's nobody was there. Nobody was there. The Rebbe, the, the Rebbe has a kiddish with the oilum, and I was part of that. I sat down by the Rebbe's table. And then afterwards we move into his private dining room where he and his family have the seed there. The person who was in charge there, he tells me, go wash yourself. I went to wash myself and I sit down by the table. Nobody was there, just me and the Rebbe. Like this. I'm like, am, am I, I getting to, am I getting punked? <laughs> yeah. What am I supposed usually when I when I when I did see him, it's like there's like five hundred thousand people around and I, you're one of them, yeah. Here I'm like right here. I was uncomfortable and I just like washed, I'm in a brook and I'm just like looking down the whole time. And I, I like look up and then I was staring at him like <laughs> he has his hand like he's just staring at me. I'm like just looking down and ran out afterwards, right? We finished up the see the ran out. And then another week, another week, another week. Then I decided Bells has some I'm saying a week after week the river would, in, would yeah, invite every, you to I, I it was a per, it was an open to every every week. Just you and him? No, it's not only him, it's his family's Oh, uh, okay. But I'm saying when I washed myself that first time, he was there by himself. Like just looking he, at he you. He had already fin he had already washed and all the all the Einiklich and his and the other people were going and washing and they were doing their own thing, like in the kitchen, whatever. And then I'm like over here sitting with the Rebbe, like Wow. But pardon the ignorance, but it's not common for the Rebbe to have Archim, to have guests at the Suda. The Rebbe has one or two that mm. are there frequently. And then usually there's like an extra. So I was that extra. Like, mm -hmm. But no. Wow. That, that, your question is... By the numbers. <laughs> very infrequent. Um, and then something like intrigued me about the Rebbe. I, I don't know what happened, what it was. Um, and then I started like listening to... to his old toitas and stuff. And I don't know, I just, like, it clicked. I started becoming more involved with people there. And then I met, like, my life mentors. Um, one of them is a son of the Klein's ice cream. Um, the, fa the, f the person who started Klein's ice cream, his name is Ephraim Klein. He has a son, his name is Yaakov Shulam Klein. He lives in Yushalayim. He himself was then, like, he had a wine factory and he had a lot of guest Shabbos. And I was very close to him. Like, I used to go to him to Shabbos by night. When I wasn't by the Rebbe, I would only eat by him. I heard dessert is epic there. Yeah. Um, it's an it's, so it's <laughs> You don't have clients asking there, but yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I used to eat with, I used to eat by him almost every Shabbos. And we developed a relationship and we were very close. We are very close to this day, but he was that male role model that I needed, and he was—he was a fire. He was the toaster that needed to keep you warm. Yes, he gave me that direction. Like then, 
it was all nice and 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 I was already in the community and like I'm starting to develop relationships but internally I was still like everything was happening quickly and I was like how, what's my goal like where am I going like how do I fix the current situation that I'm in like I literally felt like I was just like lost a little bit, right? Like I, I felt that I was like I didn't belong anywhere. I like I needed to get guidance, like how to, how to like how to prepare myself for shidduchim and for all these things. Like I didn't know anything, right? So he was he 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 instructed me through everything. He was there. I, I used to have. I not only did I have a personal relationship with him, um, more importantly, like I had a I learned with him. Muda, um, see this, and then he started putting me together with other people. And Hashem told you at the beginning, He saw He He saw exactly what I needed. It happens to be that all the people that were placed around me, if you were to ask a random person, like in bells in the community, who these people are, tell you, oh, him. I was put with a couple of these people. Who, who ended up building mayor wise. So this was all Bechesed from Hashem. No. The combination of my mother and these people built who I am today. Mikam Chayisro. Yeah. If you could take us to, I guess, present day, mayor wise, uh, you know, are you, are you married? I'm married, yes. I, I'm married four years already. Also, I have two daughters. Oh. Um, also, a lot of Seattle Shmai was part of that whole process. That's a story for itself. <laughs> part two. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I'm, uh, I'm constantly reflecting. And one of the things that I, I, I like to do and put a lot of emphasis on is, is tefillah. And davening. I feel that that as a person, I developed a lot by not necessarily um, looking at what I need, but in a sense, like taking a look at others and thinking about others, right? Um, I remember as a kid, one of the happiest moments that I had was when I left something out that I, I want to bring it in sure. to a certain level. Yeah. When I was in the early stages of researching and finding Judaism, my mother was picked up by ICE. I was maybe 15, 16. And I remember that I was left with my father and my two siblings and my sisters. I don't bring it up because it gets me emotional. So if I could, whatever. And I took lead of the house, even with my father there. My, my, I woke up in the morning, I put my brothers together and took them to school. And I always had to portray that happy face. I, ha I had to be the backbone of the family. And I remember that I had an ice cream, a haagen ice cream, small mini cup. And I was sitting together with my brothers and I was eating the ice cream. By the second scoop of, that I was about to eat, I looked up and I see my brothers just like looking at me, like craving the ice cream. A regular kid my age wasn't going to think, let me share. My ice cream, I'm going to eat it. And I stopped and I gave it to them. And I told them, divide it in half and split it. This moment for me was a very important moment because I felt happy. I felt that what I did was good. And I remember then that right afterwards, like a day afterwards, I went to visit my mother. She was in a center in New Jersey. And I asked God, 
on the way back. My brothers were crying. I was, I was, but during the visit, I didn't shed a tear. I was strong because I had to put that front for my mother. She needed to be strong. And if I cried, she was going to cry. And I knew she was going to cry. On the way back, I, I, on the, I remember asking Hashem, and I didn't know, but I said, I don't know where you are, who you are. What I know is one thing. If you exist, give me strength. Because I need it. If you exist, show me your show me show me your presence. Show me that you run the world. Show me that show me show me that you're in charge. Show me. And these dialogues almost in a sense testing, expecting results were things that I did in the future as well. And and that that's how that whole tefillah thing started shaping for me. And then it wasn't about me. You know, it was, I used to think to myself um, after, like, okay, now that I'm here, where am I holding? And I started making a reflection on, on things that I that that I saw were missing in the world, people who were suffering, people who were passing away. And I and I thought to myself, like, what do I have? I have a lot of good things. Thank God I'm here. I'm Jewish. I have, I have that blessing. And I used to say, Don't give me if you have something scheduled like some some good that you're going to give me, don't give it to me. Put it on hold. Give it to somebody else. When I'll need it, I'll borrow it back. Mm. And it's, uh, it started like be, be, it started developing into like a cycle of how I spoke to Hashem. And then today, it's uh, you receive it, you see it now. That's very cool. I, I don't ask for much. Only thing I ask, because. I said before about a purpose. My purpose is different from yours. It's different from yours. At the end of the day, you have a Zayda that you can go to after this and you could talk to him and you could say, oh, I met Mayor Weiss and he's a yeah, and this. I don't have anything. The responsibility of building Deuters falls on my shoulders. That's not an easy thing to carry. And even, even the more so when I know that I'm not perfect and I need to better myself and and I have traits that I'm trying not to be like my father and I want to I want to be good to my kids and the only way to be to be that good father is is to be truthful and to 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 follow the truth because kids feel it they feel it they sense it and that's where life decisions change right cuz although I'm human and I'm 26 and everything's fine and loyal. I have to think to myself, I have to think more maturely than others because I have to think and I have to say, Mayor, and this is what I think, Mayor, what's going to be five, ten years from now? What are you going to look like? Even better, what are your kids going to look like? So every decision that I take has to be weighed accordingly. So there are a lot of things that I don't partake in, that I should partake in, because my cheshbon is different. I have to look out for things differently than the regular person. I, before I had my, my, my two daughters, I used to dive in every single day. Please continue my daughters. Extend, and you'll see, extend one more. One generation more. My second daughter, the same thing. Now, hopefully I'm going to still have kids, right? But help them extend their... That's how the tree is going to start forming. Well, I love the the underlying thread to... You shared something very nuanced about, you know, deferring chesed from the Ebesher to others... And that's a beautiful dynamic within tefillah. But underlying that is something that I think people that grow up 
within Yiddishkeit have a bigger avoid of doing this, which is acknowledging and participating in the relationship with the Eibishter that tefillah is. Correct. And when a person grows up learning the tefillahs before we have an understanding of what the words mean, and we're just davening the words, sometimes we're able to fluently and proficiently get through the entire davening without re recognizing and realizing that we're having a dialogue with the Eibishter. And the way you're sharing it is it started from that dialogue, from that human connection with the infinite. And then that turned into tefillah, which gave it, which gave it some form. Right. But the relationship is at the core of the whole avoida. I, I sometimes feel that people don't chap that people think like, you know, a girl comes in, like you just mentioned, and it's there. Like that was the essence. But I had to work to get there. Sometimes people can see something that's like, you'll tell them, this is white. No matter what you do, it's white. But people are not going to, just not, they'll like, okay, fine, yeah, it's white. Fine. But you don't have, when you dive into Hashem, He's listening to you. I've seen it across a lot of things. I'll go back December 31st, 2022. I had finished, I was still in college. I was looking, I, I'm an accountant, and I was looking at different options. You really got promoted from the register job. Right. <laughs> I was looking at different options when, um, whatever, different places, interviewing by all these accounting firms, and I wasn't happy. I decided to take an internship. I was going to pay $20 an hour. I didn't have enough money to cover bills. And I'm pushing through, I'm pushing through. I had borrowed money from somebody. I needed to give the money back. The cheshman was $28,000. I had 13 saved on the side that I was putting away as time went by. I promised him that I was going to pay him December 31st, 2022. That's, I gave my word. I was trying to find a high paying job here and there. It just didn't work. And then I said, you know what? Let me just, I, I've done enough. Guide me. Stop looking, I stop this. And, that. and I started working at where I'm currently at in August of 2022. Come December 31st, I had the $28,000 in full. Wow. And I thought to myself that I made the cheshbon. Maher, I asked myself, what happened here? You tried to find the highest paying job. You interviewed, you did this, you did that. You did 500 different things. You made a circle in your head. You frustrated yourself. The only thing you needed to do Hello? Yeah. Help me out. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. I need your help. Oh, you need me now. Okay, I'll help you. That's how it is. Shem is not, he's not saying, don't talk to me. Oh, you try to do your own thing? Forget, forgetting about you. When I dive in, I'm already in debt to him. He's an unlimited credit card. <laughs> no limit. I always, I'll share, I, I always say like this, Rosh Hashuna. I look back and I say, Hashem, sorry. Have good kids. Have a good wife. Good friends I have a good way that I'm heading to. What did I do to deserve it? I didn't do nothing. That's the truth. I didn't do anything. But I feel that being true to him is what 
he appreciates so much. I feel that sometimes people just like blend into what is the world and they forget who they are as a person. And I always come back to him and I tell him, look, you don't have to extend this credit line. But if you do, don't do it for my sake. Do it for him. He needs kids. I have kids already. I don't need. You can hold one back. Give one to him. Panusa. I don't have a million dollars in my bank. But I don't owe anybody money. What's Panusa for? To become rich? To have a private jet? What? To live. I don't know anybody. So that means I'm breaking even. Could be, I, I could use a million dollars. But I don't need it. At the end of the year, my balance is zero. That's what I need. I need it to break even. If you're going to throw in the million, give it to somebody else. Don't give it to me. Give the blessing to this other person. Because I know you're here, and I know you exist. And I know that no matter what challenge you give me, I'm going to be there with you till the end. Something that I couldn't say for my father, which is also a suffering that I had by him, right? But... I believe in him. And no matter what challenge he brings me, I know that ultimately I'm going to look back to it because it's happened plenty of times. It's just my... I'm still developing as a person also, right? It's not natural for a person to reflect and say, you know, like, I made a mistake here. Really, it was like this, you know, like, you're a work in progress your whole life. But plenty of times I had to give myself a smack in the back <clears> of my head, like... Come on, Maya, you didn't you really thought you were going to do this. Hashem wanted you to do this. And I look back and I, and I see all the blessings that I have. I don't deserve them. That's the truth. I don't deserve them. But I feel that when you think of other people, it's, other people need more than you. Mm -hmm. You know, the one, the one little reframe that I would offer you is that if the Eibishter decides to give you that Shefa, it's not the Eibishter saying it's not for Yenem. It might just be him inviting you to be that vehicle to get it to Yenem. To be the Elio Hanavi. Hmm. There are those who say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mayor Weiss. Mayor Weiss. It's... Uh, well, it's been an absolute pleasure hearing your story. You know, many times I come into an episode and I really, I know a lot of the content. I know the stories. I didn't know much. I didn't know much about, about your story, about you, but like, I'm very, very happy now that I do. And I'm very happy that now a lot of people will as well. Wish you much. Hatzlacha. Shevnacha from your children. Parnasa. More than even breaking even, you know, so for others. With Dyrus, with Dyrus. Dyrus and Dyrus. From your beautiful family tree. I'm saying the point of the point of it is 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 not for me not to have, and Yana should have, is that no matter the challenge, the pa the power of my closeness to Hashem, I'm not gonna deviate from him. I'm still stuck with him. Yeah, I'm latched to him. Mm -hmm. Can't get rid of me. Mm -hmm. There are others that they need it. They need it more than me. Yeah. Wow. Wow. My, my bracha to you, my birchas hedya to you, is that the authenticity, just sitting here in the room, like I can I can feel how alive and how on fire your neshama is, and I hope it comes across on the on the audio. Mm. But being in this room, I feel like I'm ignited. It's palpable. It's mamish is. And my bracha to you is that you had shared that the nature of, of his chachas is that it fades. And my bracha to you is that fire, that authenticity, that genuine connection and relationship that you have worked so hard to build and to have with your creator, that you continue to build that and renew that and continue to build that fire. Oh, Amen. Thank you. Ditto. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that this isn't the last we're going to be seeing or hearing of Mayor Weiss. But, but thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Big thank you to Mayor for coming in and telling us his story. We'd love to feature more people's stories. You know, 
doesn't they don't have to be super well known have been on the cover of any magazines or anything like that uh i find that some of the best episodes come from these hidden gems like mayor and uh maybe you're from williamsburg or bar park and you and you see mayor maybe you work within the city and maybe you didn't know about this story but what a gem you know he went out of his comfort zone to tell us a story he's more of an introverted introverted guy but the the neshama pouring out of this fellow unbelievable unbelievable a big thank you to him big thank you to the people at least Schwab that made this happen uh that facilitated this episode and of course make sure to leave a rating a review on our podcast meaningful people podcast we're coming at you with some more episodes yes we'll have stuff for you before tish above after tish above during the nine days amazing episodes coming your way please make sure to leave a rating and review i can't wait to present you with some more content Hope you enjoyed this video from Meaningful Minute. We have so much more content for you. You may like this. You may like this. Take your pick. Let us know what you think.